This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, welcome to Fellows Conference. Our speaker this morning is Dr. John Lisko. Uh, John is a native of the Buckeye State. Uh, spent the first couple decades plus of his life there. He's a graduate of Youngstown State University. And if I recall, Northeastern Ohio uh, Medical School. Uh, came here for residency. I met him on his first day of residency because he was interested in cardiology and really wanted to work with Dr. Stam Larrakis, uh, the, the imager extraordinaire and former faculty member. He actually didn't want to work with Stam Larrakis, but I'd, I think I introduced him to Dr. Larrakis or told him about Dr. Larrakis. Anyway, and here we are several years later. Uh, he uh, is now a first year clinical fellow, third year fellow in our clinical investigator track. He did research with our structural team the past couple of years, is interested in ultimately pursuing a career in structural heart disease. And he's going to talk to us today about a niche of structural heart disease, which is transcatheter electrosurgery. Dr. Lisko. Thanks so much, Dr. Williams. I'm excited to talk about this topic. It's been a big focus of the Structural Heart Group uh, and my research for the last uh, few years. Um, in terms of disclosures, uh, this presentation will discuss the off-label use of uh, commercially available products. Uh, so three main objectives for today's talk. Uh, the first is to identify patients uh, who may benefit from transcatheter electrosurgery. Two is to have a, a discussion of the principles of transcatheter electrosurgery. And three, and I think most importantly, uh, is to discuss some of the recent data supporting transcatheter electrosurgical techniques uh, and to show some examples of how it's becoming a more and more mainstream approach to treat challenging patients. Uh, and for terms of disclaimers though, uh, this is becoming a more encompassing topic as transcatheter electrosurgery goes from you know, animals to a niche to more widespread dissemination. So the majority of my talk uh, will focus on the common approaches that we use here at Emory. There are some variations throughout the country uh, and internationally. Uh, these techniques, again, have now been successfully performed outside of Emory and outside of a few niche centers through proctorship programs. So they are really disseminating. Uh, and they've even uh, gone as far as to go internationally uh, throughout almost every continent. Uh, and importantly, uh, these techniques are not experimental, meaning they're not under an IRB protocol. They're not as part of a clinical research trial. Uh, they are routine clinical care, especially for patients that have no options. Uh, so I'd like to start with a case of a 64-year-old African, 64 African-American woman who presented with a chief complaint uh, of having shortness of breath, which we all see all the time. Uh, her past medical history was significant for coronary disease, hypertension, peripheral vascular disease, and COPD. So just looking at that past medical history on, on first blush, starts to have, be concerned that there's obviously a wide differential for why she's short of breath. But if this is a valid disease patient, you could obviously start to think this is certainly not someone that is low risk. Uh, her exact words at the time of the clinic visit were, I can't walk room to room. This is uh, two of her echocardiograms, which show two um, valvular issues, one on the left uh, being severe aortic stenosis with a mean pressure gradient of almost 45, uh, and the second being calcific uh, mitral stenosis uh, with a mean pressure gradient of 18 at a heart rate of 70. So this, I think, brings up the interesting topic of multivalvular uh, heart disease. Uh, which has traditionally been treated only surgically. Uh, and these patients have been excluded from every single tr clinical trial of TAVR um, published to date. But I think it raises the question, should this be treated only surgically? Um, and a group of physicians from Canada actually just looked at this in a pretty big study over 19 years where they looked at patients undergoing surgical aortic valve replacement that were quote, low risk um, by STS score. And what you can see from this graph is that in um, people that had only aortic stenosis and were low risk had a, is the blue line, and they had a 30-day mortality of 1.7%, which is less than the predicted uh, mortality by their score. But when you have concomitant mitral and tricuspid valve disease, uh, 
um, mitral, I'm sorry, mitral or tricuspid valve disease. That 30-day mortality ranged closer to 5.6%, which was obviously uh, statistically higher than people with isolated aortic valve disease, but importantly is higher than predicted by the STS score alone. Um, so this really represents a group of patients where transcatheter approaches become more attractive in an effort to do two, quote, lower risk procedures rather than one surgery that while may give an uh, ultimate one-time fix, uh, has a higher rate of mortality than expected. Looking in that, this is the new um, set of guidelines that was published a few weeks back. And just because it's so new, I thought it would be useful to go through just for aortic valve uh, disease only. So you can see that rather than just based off uh, a, uh, I'm sorry, STS score alone, there is now more of a comprehensive uh, patient level assessment. So again, it starts at a level of looking at patient risk and gets pretty quickly divided into either higher prohibitive surgical risk, which is the right side of this graph. And you can see these are the folks that you would think are high risk, right? At 30% uh, 30 day mortality greater than 8%, people that are frail, people that have, uh, multi-organ failure. And then even if these people are high risk and they have a life expectancy that's greater than one year, your choices are either TAVR or palliative care for your higher surg prohibitive surgical risk, which is the minority and minority of patients that we see. So moving down to the people we see in everyday clinical practice, the first question now becomes, is vitamin K anticoagulation contraindicated? If it's contraindicated, then your choice goes down here to a bioprosthetic valve. If it's not, we again move to an age assessment. Um, if someone's less than 50, the, the recommendation is for a mechanical AVR. If someone's between six, 50 and 65, it's a discussion between mechanical or bioprosthetic. And if someone's greater than 65, uh, the recommendation is now for a bioprosthetic valve in large part because of the um, of availability and feasibility of valve and valve therapies. Moving down the bioprosthetic um, pathways here, um, basically agreeing that someone has severe AS or asymptomatic AS with an EF less than 50. Um, or and do, the next question is, do they have valve disease um, and vascular anatomy suitable for TAVR? If the answer to that is no, the answer is then SAVR. Um, and again, it's important that the guidelines emphasize transfemoral TAVR, which we can talk about that more um, but those are the folks that had the greatest mortality benefit in the clinical trials uh, with people having non-femoral uh, access, having higher than expected mortality. And then again, looking at the age, if they're less than 65, recommendation still remains for ta uh, SAVR, 65 to 80, SAVR or transfemoral TAVR, and then greater than 80, uh, TAV is a class one indication and SAVR is 2A. Uh, this patient that I presented today had um, non rheumatic but calcific mitral stenosis, um, which I think it's important to realize what is the recommendation for even fixing this. It's a 2B recommendation, and it's that valve intervention may be considered only after discussion of the high procedural risk and the individual patient's preferences and values. So, as with all the structural patients, um, surgical consultation is the first step. And in this patient, the surgeons quickly said no. So then we move on to how to treat a surgical turndown. And this is largely, I think, the approach throughout the country, but especially at Emory, uh, where the first question is, if you have two valve disease, why not treat the valve disease that's easier first, being the aortic valve? Um, and then you start asking yourself the question, is the patient a candidate for TAVR? Um, and basically three large questions fall under there. One being, is there an appropriate uh, valve size for this patient? Is there suitable iliofemoral access? And is there a risk of coronary obstruction? Once those are answered, you can move on to, well, will this patient's mitral valve improve uh, after following TAVR? And then if it doesn't improve, what are your choices? And similar to the surgical world, there's two main options, one being transcatheter repair and one being transcatheter replacement. Transcatheter repair allows for a commercially available mitra clip, which is the only commercially available repair device on the market at this time. Uh, that's approved for both functional MR and degenerative MR. There's also investigational mitral uh, repair devices from other companies trying to compete in this space that are basically mimics of the mitral clip. 
the next question becomes, well, what about transcatheter replacement? So we'll talk about this more, but the main question we ask is, is there a risk of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction following valve implant? Can you use an off-label sapien three valve in the mitral position? Or can you do transcatheter mitral valve replacement using an investigational device? Because, because currently there are no commercially available FDA approved transcatheter mitral valve replacement systems on the market. This is just to run through kind of what the valve choices are that are commonly used at uh, Emory. Uh, this is the Edwards Sapien three valve. It's their latest generation transcatheter heart valve. Uh, just to hit kind of some of the salient points is that it is a cobalt chromium frame that allows for high radial strength and resist fracture. Uh, the leaflets are, are both thick and elastic. It's made out of a bovine pericardium uh, and it has uh, anti-calcification technology. This is the newest generation of med the Medtronic valve. It's called the Evolute. Uh, it's made of nitinol, which is a nickel titanium alloy that has the property of uh, memory and uh, super elasticity. So this is actually a balloon expandable, oh, sorry, a self expandable valve, meaning that the valve is compressed and then the recoil of the nitinol actually stents open the existing aortic valve. Um, the Edwards valves we call an annular valve, meaning it's put at the level of the aortic annulus. The Medtronic valve is a super annular valve. So if you look at this line here, you can see that the valve is actually located higher um, than at the level of the aortic annulus, which theoretically allows for lower gradients. And there's some question that over time, does that give you better valve durability? Um, but this valve has a higher pacemaker rate. So then it moves on to if we're going down the TAVR pathway, these questions are, uh, what are the relevant questions in valve choice? So number one is what's gonna give the patient the best hemodynamics? Number two, is there a high likelihood that the coronaries will need to be accessed in the future? Because remember, with a surgical valve, the surgeons excise the leaflets and sew in a new uh, bioprosthetic valve or the mechanical valve, whereas with transcatheter valve replacement, the native leaflets are forever stented open and can get in the way of the coronaries. Additionally, the cage can get in the way of the coronaries. And if you look at the Evolute valve again, you can see that this skirt, it actually goes up to about 14 millimeters on the valve uh, and can hit right in the level of the coronaries, uh, making it more difficult to access. And then again, does this patient have a pacemaker knowing that uh, in the published data to date, pacemaker rates were much higher uh, with the Evolute valve than they were with the Sapien valve. So Dr. Gleason talked about this quite a bit at the fellows conference on Wednesday, but the majority of decisions for TAVR are made using a CT. Uh, uh, it is uh, probably one of the biggest moves forward in delivering valves safely and effectively. Uh, the valve is sized two different ways. Uh, for the Edwards valve, it's sized by area and for the Medtronic valve, it's sized by perimeter. Anyone that's done the structural rotation has probably done a bunch of these so far. So when we look at this, this patient's annulus sizes for a 23 valve. Um, the patient does have known coronary disease, so they may need access in the future and they don't have a pacemaker. So in totality, this would push us toward using an Edwards valve in this case. So now we've answered the first question in the workup, is there an appropriate valve size? So now we need to move on to, is there pseudo, suitable iliofemoral access? And this is the patient's TAVR CT, where you can see that this patient uh, in the sense of having peripheral vascular disease, it's actually had some, uh, some work done uh, and has uh, femoral arteries, or sorry, an iliofemoral system uh, that's less than 5.5 centimeters so not available for traditional transfemoral arterial access. So now we have one issue uh, that is highlighted in red. So now we move on to the next issue that, well, we can't go through the leg, but if the valve can be deployed, is there a risk of coronary obstruction? Coronary obstruction risk assessment is a challenging uh, endeavor on CT because there's many unknowns and a lot of variables that you have to predict. But in general, if your coronary heights are higher than 11 centimeters, you should be okay. So this patient's left coronary height was 11 and the right coronary height was 15.2. And again, less than 10 should be the number that kind of sets off in your head. Maybe there's something wrong here. So now we've, we've crossed off a few more questions. So we see that we otherwise have a TAVR candidate, just not someone eligible for traditional femoral access. And then we can move on to the question of what should we do if this patient's uh, mitral valve disease doesn't improve? 
So this patient has mitral stenosis, not mitral regurgitation. So in, in all a sense, the transcatheter repair options are all off of the table. The next question becomes, well, is there a risk of LVOT obstruction? Can we use an off-label valve or is there a role for a trial? Um, LVOT obstruction is this concept that the anterior mitral leaflet can be forced into a permanently open position uh, during transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Um, and that causes uh, obviously an acute subaortic obstruction with a 69% risk of mortality uh, at 30 days. Uh, the risk, the, this is defined as having a, an area less than 200 um, or a long anterior mitral leaflet being greater than two centimeters. This patient has a neo-LVOT model on CT of 117 millimeters squared, um, placing the patient at um, preclusively high risk for LVOT obstruction. So now we have a patient that doesn't have appropriate transfemoral options, doesn't have really great mitral options. So the question becomes, what can you do for these no option patients? And at Emory, that answer has been uh, the field of transcatheter electrosurgery, which was really pioneered uh, by the group at Emory, uh, as well as our colleagues at uh, NHLBI and Bethesda. So I'd like to talk about kind of a bit now, moving on from a routine case to what is transcatheter electrosurgery and what's the data to support it. Uh, this is a nice review that was written by Jaffer Khan and uh, the, the structural heart team, uh, really going through the fundamental principles uh, of the technique. So first and foremost, transcatheter electrosurgery is a family of procedures and it utilizes conventional equipment in an off-label way. You get radio frequency energy and that's basically used to either vaporized tissue, traverse tissue or lacerated. And it enables therapeutic options for patients that are ineligible for commercial structural heart interventions, much like the one I just presented. Uh, the fundamental basic physics, and this is I promise where the physics will stop, is that transcatheter electrosurgery relies on the tissue conducting alternating currents between two electrodes. And if you use a high frequency AC current at around 500 kilohertz, it doesn't stimulate the surrounding tissues. So you don't get muscle contractions, you don't get pain, you don't get nerve firing. Uh, and then this current travels through the tissues, causes resistive heating and ultimately uh, tissue destruction in a controlled fashion. It uses Bovey cautery. So there's two important parts here. One is cutting versus one is versus coagulation. Um, so tissue um, cutting is the goal of transcatheter electrosurgery. And that's achieved by using tissue vaporization. So you have a rapid and focal increase in the current density that lies for a temperature rise. And then you have a high current over a short period of time and you're able to perform cutting. If you have well, you're on coagulation mode, what you have is an interrupted waveform. There's intercurrent cooling, slower heating, and that's intended to cause coagulation, which for endovascular work, if you coagulate in a blood vessel, you increase your risk for stroke, as well as your uh, risk for thromboembolic events. These are the tools that are somewhat germane to transcatheter electrosurgery. So first and foremost, you need an electrosurgery generator, um, a coronary guide wire that's modified. The, the ideal coronary guide wire uh, is a polymer jacketed wire because that has the polymer jacket has insulating properties. And then a wire that has a high tip load because you're using this wire to push through um, target tissues. Um, and that gives you some more pushability, much like the CTO space. So actually CTO wires are what are used. Uh, so the common wire is the Estato 20 gram. This isn't the only wire that can electrify, but is, is the most commonly used. Uh, then an insulating polymer jacket, which is a, basically is a micro catheter. The principle behind that is that the insulating polymer jacket, jacket further uh, insulates the wire and keeps the current from dispersing and instead going to the, the tip where you're either traversing a tissue or lacerating a tissue. And then 5% dextrose is used in the majority of these procedures because flushing the um, area with dextrose eliminates blood. And if you remember, blood is an ionic substance, so it will lead to charring of the wire and dispersion of force whereas dextrose is non-ionic. So if the field is flooded with dextrose, the electrical um, charge that the operator is creating will be confined to the tip of the wire where you're uh, intending it to go. So this is um, the initial family of transcatheter electrosurgical techniques. So moving left to right here, there's transcable access, um, which allows for transfemoral venous to arterial taver in patients without uh, conventional options. There is lampoon, which allows for splitting of the anterior mitral leaflet to prevent 
uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. There's uh, a close cousin of lampoon, which is basilica, which is splitting an aortic valve leaflet um, to prevent coronary obstruction. There's elastic, which is the laceration of a surgically placed alfieri stitch to allow transcatheter mitral valve replacement using a sapien valve in a ring. There's anagrade lampoon, which is a simplification of the retrograde lampoon technique, and we'll go through that. There's tip to base lampoon, which is another lampoon variant uh, that's again a simplification and applicable to patients with a mitral ring in place. And then there's the elastic clip, which is similar to elastic, but instead of uh, lacerating a surgical alfieri stitch, you're instead lacerating a mitral clip. And we're gonna run through these and some of the data. Transcable access is the only type of access here that only requires a, a, a pinhole um, size burn. Everything else requires laceration. So in an effort to improve the chances of successful laceration, this concept of the flying V has come up named after the iconic guitar. And the flying V uh, is created kind of in panels A, B, and C here. So what you see here is that you have an astato wire that's polymer jacketed. The uh, jacket is scraped off using the, uh, a scalpel, and then the wire is bent on the scalpel. So what you create here in figure C is an ablative surface uh, that really focally confines your energy right to this knuckle. Uh, and this is helpful because laceration, you need to have a controlled, targeted, and directed radio frequency. It's obviously gonna take longer to lacerate something than it would be just to traverse it. So this helps with that. Um, laceration also requires higher energy. So by focusing that energy in one space, you avoid wire charring, you avoid uh, coagulation. So moving on to the first of the trans, uh, the electrosurgical techniques is trans cable. So these are the other alternate access strategies. So there's trans carotid traver, trans aortic or trans apical, perk ax, um, using a shock with lithotripsy balloon or trans cable. Um, but the question is, which of these is the only one that has ever been prospectively studied in any systematic way? And that is trans cable taver. Here's a video of how trans cable works. I'm gonna try and get it to play. In the body, the aorta, through a neighboring vein in the abdomen. Transcable access takes advantage of an observation from nature that all the organs in the body are bathed in a fluid that has slightly higher pressure than the blood that flows through the veins. So if we poke a hole in the artery and leave it that way, of course, there will be bleeding. But if we poke a hole in an artery without using surgery, and we also poke a hole in the vein nearby, instead of there being blood accumulating outside the organs, bleeding will spontane spontaneously stop. And that is the, the physiology of transcable access. Here's just to prove that you see there's this is a um, pigtail catheter going from the cava into the aorta with an injection. And you see that when injection happens, blood goes from the aorta into the cava without massive exsanguination uh, into the retroperitoneal space. And again, that's the physiology here is that the pressure in the IVC is typically around 10 millimeters of mercury in a normal person. Well, the pressure in the RP space is usually closer to 20. So what you have here is a venous sink. This is the transcable IDE. It was led by Dr. Adam Greenbaum, Dr. Bavlieros, uh, and Dr. Letterman from NIH. It looked at 100 patients uh, who were all at prohibitive risk, um, and, or sorry, high risk, and had no other good option for access. You can see that the STS score in this cohort was 9.6%, uh, which is almost partner one type patients um, and certainly higher risk patients that we see today. You can see that they had a large number uh, of concomitant comorbidities. And this is the outcome through seven days, uh, sorry, 30 days. So you can see that at 30 days, 92% um, of the patients uh, were alive, which is better than the predicted STS score. You can see that death was uh, cardiovascular in seven and non-cardiovascular in one. Um, and that you could see that there was a good number of people uh, in this population, but the minority that required transfusion of blood, which is the obvious concern uh, when you're accessing from the cava to the aorta. 
uh, and that the people who did require blood required a median of two units, so not huge amounts. And this is the bleeding. So you can see, again, the key complication would be life-threatening bleeding, which were five um, retroperitoneal hematomas, or hemorrhages, I'm sorry, um, two large, two moderate, one small. Uh, and again, despite this, the vast majority of people did exceptionally well after 30 days. This is just a, a schematic of transcable access. So what you see here is a um, guiding catheter, typically a renal guide. Uh, through that, an electrified wire system, which is usually that 014 wire insulated in a piggyback microcatheter, insulated in a Navicross, is advanced using a controlled less than two second burn from the cava into the aorta. And subsequently, and I think the more impressive picture is the one on the right where you see endographs uh, and you see the taver sheath easily being passed uh, from the inferior vena cava uh, into the aorta and up. Uh, after transcable access is obtained, the joke is an incidental taver is performed in the standard way. Uh, and then it moves on uh, to the closure. So what's used to close the tract is actually an Amplatz or ductor occluder, which is an off-label use of this device. Uh, and it is pulled against the aortic wall and can seal off um, the tract. There is a dedicated device made by a company uh, called Transmural Systems, which has been studied uh, and has gotten 100% uh, uh, occlusion, but that uh, data is published, but the device hasn't been commercially made available yet. So that's the first set of, and kind of the, the initial trans uh, electrosurgical technique. The next is what do you do about patients that have coronary obstruction? So the first is, well, who's at risk for coronary obstruction? And that is again placed at the TAVR CT. So people who have a low coronary ostea, like we talked about less than 10, people that have aortic leaflets that are higher than the coronary ostea, and then a valve to coronary distance less than four millimeters. If your aortic leaflets reach the STJ and can seal off the entire uh, area, if you have a prior bioprosthetic valve where the leaflets are mounted, what's called externally, and they're gonna be permanently pushed open, if you have a stentless valve, if you plan to fracture the valve and make it uh, even bigger, or if you don't have coronary filling on a balloon a valvular plasty, suggesting that it's gonna occlude, these people are at the highest risk. So the technique to overcome this is called basilica. Here's a cartoon, and how basilica works is that you have two catheters, uh, one on the leaflet side, one on the LVOT, a wire is electrified and traverses the leaflet. That wire is then externalized and the flying V is created. And then you can see you have laceration uh, of the leaflet in a controlled fashion. Uh, and the TAVR valve is implanted uh, without any issues. And you can see how you get the coronary flow on the right where you wouldn't on the left. Again, Basilica was studied in a prospective multi-center investigation uh, led by the NIH and the Emory team. And this is what the results of that study look like. So 93% of patients, which is 28 out of 30, uh, had successful um, basilica traversal and laceration. There is 100% survival, 100% first implant uh, device success, 100% freedom from coronary obstruction, 100% freedom from emergency surgery, and 93% overall uh, procedural success. Uh, but the technique was considered to be overly complex using commercially available uh, guiding catheters. Uh, so then in conjunction between the NIH industry, industry and Emory, uh, there was the development of these pachyderm-shaped guiding catheters to simplify leaflet traversal, uh, named so much after the elephant trunk. So you can see uh, that this looks like kind of like a modified Amplatz curve. And what this data showed was that in a small number of patients, uh, there was successful, successful leaflet traversal similar to the IDE, with significantly decreased time. Look at that. It went from 45 minutes in the Basilica IDE to eight minutes uh, with the pachyderm catheter uh, and no significant difference in any of the relevant outcomes. Lampoon is now the approach for mitral. So this is a cartoon of classic retrograde lampoon where you see kind of the same things occurring. Uh, let me restart the video. So you see that in retrograde lampoon, two retrograde guiding catheters are placed through the aorta a wire is electrified and snared in the atrium after it traverses the anterior leaflet. The wire is externalized. The flying V is created, electrified, and then lacerated in the direction of the LVOT so that you have a leaflet that's split. 
And when you put in a sapien valve, you can see the difference with and without lampoon, where on the left, you would have LVOP obstruction, where on the right, blood is free to flow through those cells. Again, lampoon was studied uh, in a prospective way, again, led by the same team of names you're getting pretty used to seeing by now. It was done in 30 patients, and this is actually impressive because 100% uh, again had successful lampoon traversal and laceration. There is successful access, delivery, and retrieval of the lampoon system in 100% of patients. 97% of patients exited the lab with an LVOT gradient less than 30, which was considered optimal and survivable. 100% um, left the lab with a gradient less than 100, which was considered acceptable. 90% had a successful deployment of the first TMVR. And that you can see that only 27% required an additional intervention. So to look through that, four needed an alcohol septal ablation, uh, one needed surgery for PVL, and one uh, had a percutaneous closure for a dehist ring. So um, impressive survival at 100% and 73% procedural success, again, driven by this. So this survival is the highest ever reported from a mitral trial. And despite that, uh, the editorial for this article um, basically said that that's a great technique, but it's not gonna work unless it can be simplified uh, and democratized for other operators to perform. And this led uh, to the development of the anagrade lampoon technique, um, which is used to prevent uh, LVOT obstruction as well. This was a really cool collaboration between NIH and Emory, where it was done originally in animals at NIH, uh, and then ultimately done uh, in first patients uh, here. This is a cartoon schematic. So if you remember the video, both catheters were going retrograde through the aortic valve. If you look at panel A, what you see here are two transeptal sheaths that are going through a single transeptal puncture. Um, and then you have your anti-grade guiding system, you burn through the leaflet and um, perform laceration toward the atria. This is probably better shown in a couple key videos. So here on the left, what you see is an LAO projection with two transeptal catheters. Uh, and just to orient, right, so we're coming up through the IVC through uh, the inner atrial septum. One of these wires is burning through the um, base of the anterior mitral leaflet. And then there's a pre-positioned snare in the LVOT to catch that wire. Once that wire is captured, it's externalized to make a wire loop. And that's what you see happening uh, on the right side here. And then once that occurs, you make the flying V and you, you can pull back and cause laceration. So we're lacerating here, let me play that again, lacerating um, from base to tip uh, into the left atrium. And here are kind of the patient characteristics of the first eight patients that were done at Emory. Again, you can see the majority of these patients are female, both in anti-grade lampoon and also in the original lampoon IDE study. You can see that a lot have comorbidities uh, that are very common in this population. Uh, the majority of the anti-grade lampoon patients were done in MAC, which is a high risk characteristic, uh, characteristic at baseline. And you can see from the CT characteristics of this patient population uh, that the predicted neo-LVOT was in the beyond prohibitive range um, with a median of 80, sorry, mean of uh, 83 uh, millimeters squared. Again, similar to the retrograde lampoon arm, but exceptionally, exceptionally high risk. Um, and looking at the anti-grade outcomes, you see that there is 100% successful traversal, 100% successful laceration, all of the lacerations were midline and not eccentric, and that um, the outcomes overall were very similar down the page to the original gold standard of retrograde lampoon. But importantly, if you look at the time from leaflet traversal to TMVR, which is largely the lampoon part of the procedure, in the anti-grade arm, it was 39 plus or minus nine minutes, whereas in retrograde, it was 65 plus or minus 35. So based on the time data, it suggests that this is a big, technical simplification of the procedure with equally successful results. Uh, and that leads to the question of, can this technique be simplified even further? And that led to a, a manuscript that's just been accepted for publication uh, on tip to base lampoon in patients with a um, 
protected mitral annulus, which basically means a prior surgical mitral valve or a mitral ring. So here's a cartoon schematic of what tip to base lampoon is. So all the lampoons we've looked at so far have required a two-step process of leaflet traversal followed by leaflet laceration. Uh, but this modification of the technique was developed so that if a patient has a ring or a valve that's gonna serve as a protective backstop, it can be crossed uh, in an anagrade sense and then a wire from the aorta can be snared in a retrograde sense just to create a lacerating surface that you see right here in panel B. This lacerating surface can then be pulled back once it's electrified all the way from the tip of the anterior mitral leaflet to the base. Uh, and it can be used um, to get the deepest laceration possible because you know you hit the base at the end. And then a, a transcatheter valve can be implanted. Interestingly, this can also be used as a rescue strategy. So if a patient uh, undergoes a transcatheter mitral valve in ring, and then has an LVOT obstruction, because you can imagine there could be leaflet hanging right over here. The same technique can be done where the valve is crossed in an anagrade fashion, uh, and there's a wire coming down the aorta, which you see in panel B. It's made into a lacerating surface uh, with the flying V in red, and it's simply electrified and pulled back until you hit this, and you split all the leaflet that would be obstructing the LVOT. Now you still have leaflet covering the transcatheter heart valve, but at least you can get rid of the overhanging leaflet uh, and potentially re uh, reduce LVOT uh, gradients. Here's a video showing both. So you see again, you cross the aortic valve, create a wire loop in the standard fashion. Once that's done, it's externalized and the flying V is created. So this is probably the most impressive picture of laceration. So you see you wanna move it up so that you're on the middle of the A2 scallop, which is happening here. And then laceration is occurred by electrifying and pulling back to the base of the, the base of the protective backstop. And now that leaflet is split. And then TMVR is performed uh, in the standard fashion. And next up, there should be a case of uh, rescue lampoon, rescue tip to base lampoon. in which you just simply create the lacerating system and then pull back as much as you can to the implanted transcatheter heart valve and let's split the leaflet to allow flow. Again, this was studied, this was a multi-center endeavor that we um, just uh, collaborated with our, uh, the folks participating it on. 21 patients in the US that we know about uh, have undergone tip to base lampoon. Uh, and we compared that to people in the lampoon IDE who would have a protected mitral annulus, which again means would have a ring, a band, um, or a valve in place. Uh, and you can see again the same trends you've been seeing before an older cohort of patients, uh, majority of which are females, many comorbidities, um, high risk patients. Um, and then you can see in the tip to base, uh, 10 patients had an annuloplasty ring, 11 had a prior valve, uh, and the, the therapy was used 19 times as a preventive strategy, twice as a rescue strategy. That's a big difference between retrograde lampoon, which cannot be used as a retro, um, which cannot be used as a rescue a strategy. And again, a small neo LVOT um, to suggest a high risk cohort. Here are the procedural outcomes. Again, it's uh, similar to the uh, other lampoon variants where you have 100% successful laceration, 100% successful deployment. In patients that had a um, LVOT obstruction, it was used as a rescue technique. It was 100% successful uh, in uh, ameliorating the gradient. Um, there were in this situation, two cases that required cardiac surgery. Uh, and that is because the, when the catheters were pulled back, sorry, when the wire was pulled back, the, it wasn't well insulated and it actually caused uh, a laceration of the aorta, um, which is a known now um, complication of the technique that's highly cautioned against. Uh, but again, despite that, you can see that you had 100% uh, survive the procedure and 100% survival to 30 days. And again, another prohibitive risk cohort uh, 
Um, so there are some future directions for this technique. Uh, Dr. Nicholson has used this in the coronary space uh, with ECART, uh, which uses electrosurgery to burn back into um, a chronically occluded vessel. We have used this uh, in conjunction uh, with Abbott Vascular to implant their tendine valve in patients that have uh, a prior mitral clip that has failed, that's so-called elastic clip. Uh, and it's also been used to fenestate through endografts uh, and facilitate uh, pulmonic valve replacement in patients that otherwise did not have um, an option for traditional TPVR. Uh, I'd like to say thank you uh, to all uh, my mentors and collaborators uh, here at Emory and all the folks that have worked with us uh, on projects uh, throughout the country and happy to take any questions. Thank you, John. Uh, very good talk. Th good job powering through the technical difficulties. Um, uh, I don't have any questions at this time. And I'll, I'll open up the floor to anyone out there who has any questions for John. John, John Andy Smith here. Could, could hey, you Dr. just Smith. comment on the um, on when you talk about collaboration with the NIH? What what are the folks at the NIH actually doing? Can you Fill us in a little bit more on that collaboration. Sure, absolutely. So um, the NIH has uh, a division of intramural uh, research that has tenured clinical investigators, uh, and they basically have the freedom uh, to push boundaries and do what they think are the most cutting edge things that can impact patients, um, especially small patient niches um, that may not have a ton of industry support uh, for the therapies. Uh, and they develop the techniques um, from kind of the bench to bedside perspective. So they have um, the basic science support, the animal lab, uh, and will do the experimental parts on animals. And then once it's been safely produced uh, in animals uh, and the appropriate patient comes along that is high risk and has no other option, uh, Emory will be the first person to do that patient's case uh, and then if it's successful, what you saw happen with Transcable and Lampoon, the NIH is able to sponsor uh, an IDE trial and actually prospectively look at this uh, with a clinical adjudication committee and a clinical events committee uh, and try and give the science uh, even more backing uh, through rigorous investigation. Uh, John, Stan Sherman, uh, <laughs> what, what happened with your original patient? The original patient uh, underwent a transcable TAVR that was successful uh, and then underwent anti-grade lampoon uh, TMVR uh, and did well afterwards and actually went home after four days. So you didn't have to approach the mitral stenosis then? No, I'm sorry. The, the mitral stenosis was approached using a valve and MAC. Um, sorry if I wasn't uh, clear on that point. So she underwent anti-grade lampoon. I had her anterior leaflet uh, split and then a sapien valve was put uh, in her um, mitral annular calcification. Gotcha, good job. All right, well, uh, fantastic review, John, of uh, exciting thank you. Uh, new technology. And thank you to everyone for being here this morning. And thank you, John, for your hard work. Thank and you. Uh, we look forward to seeing everybody uh, next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.